Desire expresses itself by producing what it desires, but it requires cooperation with other desiring machines, each with their own flows, codes, and breaks. For this reason, once we have desiring machines with their desiring production, we immediately have desire's investments in the socius, a social field forming a collectivity of desiring machines. From this socius emerges organized superstructures that produce their own codes to then regulate these desiring machines. And herein we arrive at the social machine. The social machine codifies, inscribes, and records flows of desire, ensuring that they're adequately dammed up, channeled, and regulated. Deleuze and Guattari state, every machine has a sort of code built into it, stored up inside it. However, whereas desiring machines are irreducible to their own imminently produced codes since the flows of desire also produced by them are wildly uncontainable and excessive, social machines produce codes that aim at containing and directing this excessiveness. To do this, they exert a secondary repressive force against desiring machines. This social repression is prior to any psychic repression. And indeed, psychoanalysis's focus on psychic repression, conceptualized in terms of Oedipus and castration, will serve as an instrument for both obfuscating and accepting this social repression. The socialization and codification of desire takes on different forms, and in Chapter 3, Deleuze and Guattari lead us through a kind of genealogy of social machines reminiscent of Nietzsche's analysis of morality in the genealogy of morals. The history they present us with here includes the emergence of three distinct social machines, the primitive territorial machine, the despotic machine, and the modern capitalist machine, each of the former making possible the emergence of the latter, and each of the latter being a latent possibility defended against by each of the former. We'll be taking up these social machines in what follows, in the ways they distinctly regulate desire, and how this genealogy culminates in the emergence of Oedipus. The territorial machine marks the first social machine to codify desire. These machines pertain to societies organized by specific types of relationships called alliances and affiliations, or kinship. Alliances are lateral relations uniting groups to form a tribal society. Affiliations are relations among generations to form a kind of lineage. It's helpful to keep in mind that this analysis comes in the wake of those French anthropologists who examined the structures of such societies, most notably Marcel Moss and Claude Lévi-Strauss. Lévi-Strauss conceptualized social relations in terms of what is called alliance theory which is based on the notion of the incest taboo as a proposed universal prohibition that urges family members to marry outside the family. And this initiates a kind of circle of exchange in which one member of a family marries a member of another family in exchange for one of their members marrying a member of that other family. This might be sometimes uh, what we think of as arranged marriages. This mode of reciprocal exchange is thought to be what establishes peace among groups. And we can perhaps see how this theory directly connects to Freud's proposal for a primordial incest prohibition as discussed, for example, in Total Men Taboo, a point that will become important soon. In their analysis of the territorial machine, Deleuze and Guattari dispute this claim regarding the universality of the incest taboo. They also resist the assumption that kinship affiliation is primary and alliances are somehow derivative of this more primordial mode of relating. Instead, they argue that alliances play a far more fundamental role in social life and that in the territorial machine, affiliations are more so derivative of alliances rather than the other way around, and they do spend a good number of pages providing examples that support their claim. This is not them denying that there is a widespread incest prohibition in, in such societies. However, rather than be primary, this prohibition marks a distraction from a more primordial prohibition at play. To understand this, we have to see how Deleuze and Guattari deploy the notion of primitive inscription. Primitive inscription is the term used 
to identify how relations are coded in such a manner that represses and channels desire. The prohibitions of primitive inscription give rise to what they call the representative of desire, repressing representation, and the displaced representative. The representative of desire is the intensive germinal influx. This non-codable flow is the motor force for desire and what primitive inscription cannot incorporate into the code without risking disrupting the fragile social order that has been established. The repressing representative is directed against this germinal flow. It determines what part of the influx will pass through and what will not and instead remain blocked in filiations but allow to flow through alliances. Now the displaced representative is the lure or fake image born of repression that serves to conceal the true representative of desire. In other words, real desire, whatever it is, is repressed for being too threatening to the social order. To ensure it remains buried, a pseudo-desire is fabricated and then repressed in such a way as to make us believe this is what we truly desire. The incest taboo now marks a primitive example of the displaced representative, which will be important as we consider how it gets taken up by psychoanalysis in the notion of the Oedipus complex. To arrive there, however, we still have to take account of a few more social machines, next being the despotic machine. Following the territorial machine is the despotic machine, or the barbarian socius, in which Former alliances and affiliations established by the territorial machine are transformed. Now a new alliance system becomes established whereby the despot is placed in direct affiliation with a deity that alliances must now join and participate in. This concentration of power is represented virtually by the despot who is made equivalent to the state. In this sense, the despotic machine marks an inversion of social relations found in the territorial machine as affiliation becomes primary over alliances, though the affiliations here are not only based in biology, but also often in divinity. Nonetheless, the codes of the territorial machine are not entirely eradicated. Instead, they are overcoded by a new inscription. Power is now much more concentrated rather than dispersed, as was the case in the former alliances formed through territorial machines. As Deleuze and Guattari write, all the coded flows of the primitive machine are now forced into a bottleneck, where the despotic machine overcodes them. Overcoding is the operation that constitutes the essence of the state, and that measures both its continuity and its breaks with the previous formations. This despot is also equated with the paranoiac. If we think of the paranoiac in Lacanian terms, what we have is someone who rejects the predominant social order and reconstructs a new imaginary reality out of pieces from the former, often with the paranoiac taking center stage in that world and being granted a kind of specialness in their direct line connecting them to a divine being. Thus the paranoiac as we will see in schizophrenia as well, is someone who deterritorializes and decodes previously existing flows. But unlike the process of schizophrenia, the paranoiac installs himself as the central figure of a new re-territorialization of flows based on his proclaimed affiliation with a transcendent power, giving rise to the totalitarian state with the paranoiac despot as its fascist leader. Important here is the notion of the despotic signifier. Herein we might think of what Lacan means by the signifier as an abstract bit of code independent of any reference or signifieds, but which also determines and structures those signifieds, indeed overdetermines, much like the codes of the despotic machine overcode. The despotic signifier or master signifier, we might say, in playing this role now becomes the source of desire which changes the nature of desire itself from a kind of productivity into a matter of lack, since the signifier is fundamentally something transcendent, something without material instantiation, and thus something that can never be truly available to fulfill desire. Following the despotic machine is the capitalist machine, which functions quite differently from the other two formations of the socius. 
As mentioned previously, the Soceus is typically constituted by a series of codes that regulates the flows of desire. However, the capitalist machine is an exception, seeking to decode without recoding. It does this to free up the flow of capital by allowing for the expression of desire without any real limit. With this eroding of limits, the capitalist machine perpetually seeks novelty and innovation. Instead of recoding, there is a process of axiomatization, which entails reducing and flattening the products of these flows into commodities, all of which are rendered equivalent based on a uniform metric of monetary value. Whereas the overcoding of the despotic machine is based on a transcendent source of authority, an axiomatic system is determined imminently from the flows of capital. This kind of reminds me of how social media algorithms work. The algorithms are like axioms in that they are, in theory, neutral to the content of their platforms. Instead, all content is flattened down into views and watch time metrics. It's an attention economy that ultimately bows to a market economy. And from these axioms of the algorithm, particular trends and virality happen to some of the content, and the content that gets more views and watch time will be promoted even more. However, as you may already suspect with this example of social media algorithms, although the capitalist machine aims at decoding, it does not get rid of all codes. Instead, it appropriates fragments of codes from the despotic machine that can be put to work in the service of capitalism. Governmental power and religions are thought to be exemplary in this regard as they become instruments of capitalism's perpetuation. In the capitalist machine, the nuclear family acts as a kind of miniaturized state society in which the father functions as despotic ruler. As such, while the capitalist machine liberates the flows of desire from the social conditions that limited it, it aims to also contain desire by establishing internal limits that guard against its fundamental instability. It guards against any overabundance of resources by ensuring that a sense of scarcity remains a motor force for the machine and, for this reason, appropriates old codes for instantiating lack at the heart of desire. According to Deleuze and Guattari, this is where the notion of Oedipus plays its functional role within the capitalist machine. The capitalist machine appropriates fragments of the despotic code that it deems helpful in ensuring the continuous movement of desire while also constraining desire so that it neither saturates the machine with an overabundance fear to dampen desire nor leads to destructive breaks or schizes in the capitalist machine from such excesses. A solution to this is to introduce the notion of desire as lack into the system as a kind of internally governed limit in place of any real or material one. To equate desire to lack, the notion of Oedipus is introduced as a mythological and theatrical depiction of psychic life, structured not merely by partial objects, but the lack or lost totality unity they now come to signify. In other words, the idea of wholeness as an absent reality is conjured up as a means to sustain a view of desire as lack. Deleuze and Guattari claim that psychoanalysis reinforces the fantasy of subjugated groups and treats subjects as if they were perpetually sick since childhood. The principal means by which this is done is through Oedipus, and more specifically the Oedipal triangulation of the family, which is reduced to a kind of privatized society of daddy, mommy, me. The unconscious is thus no longer a factory and mode of desiring production, but a theater that portrays the representation of a mythological play. Consequently, the subject is induced into believing that there is something fundamentally missing, a lost object born of the displaced representative of an incestuous prohibition enacted by the father. This happens by inventing the idea that there are incestuous drives in need of repression by a castrating agent who cuts these incestuous flows by repressing desire. Child wants mommy, but daddy intervenes as the despot who puts a stop to it by requiring the child to become like him so that one day he may have someone like mommy since he can never truly have her entirely to himself. Thus, the despot is no longer some external social authority, but now becomes an internalized psychic dictator, a form of bad conscience as Nietzsche describes it.
In this manner, desire is both limited by a prohibition, but also forced to migrate, analogous to how the incest prohibition was theorized to do so in the territorial machine. And since those migrations of desire will never find what one is truly looking for, since desire so defined can only ever lack its object, then desire is to be an endless restlessness from one substitute object to another, which just so happens to be conducive to the productivity of the capitalist machine. And indeed, Deleuze and Guattari see psychoanalysis as a tool to move toward this aim, teaching subjects about their necessarily repressed desire while also freeing desire up so that it can continue migrating and not be too fixed on any one object for too long, as would be the case in, say, neurosis in which desire becomes overly fixated. And so they argue psychoanalysis is a perfect complement to and perpetuator of the capitalist machine, establishing Oedipus as the displaced internalized limit, substituting for the absence of any external real limit in capitalism. As such, Oedipus is, in fact, a form of resistance to desire, an artificial re-territorialization of the flows of desire aimed at keeping those flows flowing for the sake of economic growth, but without flooding the economy with too much growth by too many people. Stated otherwise, wealth continues to be concentrated in a select few capitalists through whose exorbitant wealth growth is channeled while at the same time leaving the many to toil in their pervasive sense of scarcity. Deleuze and Guattari don't deny that some elements of Oedipus mark legitimate expressions of desiring machines. Still, it is a grave error to make everything founded upon the Oedipal family, including our political and historical situation, when, in fact, it is our political and historical situation that produces the problem of, and solution for, the Oedipus complex. If you found this video helpful, want to see more, and it's within your means, please consider making a super thank you tip. You can find the super thank you button below this video. If you wish to be an ongoing supporter of this channel, you can do so on Patreon where I offer video transcripts and unedited materials. The link is below. I want to thank the following for already supporting this channel on Patreon. You can also support this channel by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. As always, thank you for watching and until next time, be well.